All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're finishing up the book of Luke. So uh, Luke chapters 22 through 24 um, says, Now the festival on unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said to take this <clears throat> and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you to do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper... He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, woe, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves, which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose, um, arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred on me so that so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel Simon Simon Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat but I have prayed for you Simon that your faith may not fail and when you have turned back strengthen your brothers but he replied Lord I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death Jesus answered I tell you Peter before the rooster crows today you will deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he numbered with the transgressor, he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching it, its fulfillment. The disciple said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you, going, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? And when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. 
Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with them, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded prophes prophesy who hit you. And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Almighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be, um, be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teachings. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he has sent back, he has sent him back to us, as you can see, he has done nothing to, des to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why, what crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the, ch blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, on to, on, into the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, 
for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who, hang, who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. <clears throat> but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from Ju the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body. And then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. <clears throat> the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood around, stood be, beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remembering, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. <clears throat> he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the, that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. 
and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not, does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you. While I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised Stay in the city until you have broken. You have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Um, hmm. I like to offer commentary, but uh, not sure, you know, how much more commentary I can add to that. Uh, my heart was pretty stirred over uh, over the whole thing. Um, so we really serve uh, an amazing God. What it must have been like to have been um, those disciples doing life with Jesus for three years, and and then to go through the, um, you know, just the horrific realities of the crucifixion and have their hearts torn right out for them to struggle. But then on the other side of things for Jesus to, uh, uh, to rise again and to appear to them and to show them that their faith is not in vain and their faith is, um, is, uh, in Jesus is founded and, um, and, and our faith um, is not in vain as we uh, as we follow him as we as we serve him and um, even in times when it's difficult um, our faith is uh, in Jesus is is solid and we need to remember uh, the one that we serve uh, no matter what we need to remember the one that we serve so uh, and incredible let's go ahead and uh um, jump over to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5. <clears throat> says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. <clears throat> God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not prote protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. 
As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they dis depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in the darkness and great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I observe, have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in, toil, in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I have those last verses are some of my favorite in scripture. Verse 20 is really powerful. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because they, God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I mean, that really is the prayer of my, um, of my heart, that God would, would just keep you know, me content and uh, keep me occupied with gladness of heart. And uh, in that way, you know, I'm not falling prey to you know, those other things. I just want to experience joy and peace in the life that I'm living. Um, enjoy the things that I have, not you know, covet and envy the things that I don't. It's not always easy. Um, sometimes I get my eyes off from the things that are important. But for the most part, I think I've been victorious in that. And God's enabled me to be able to, uh, you know, keep me occupied with gladness of heart. And I hope that's the case for you as well. And I think that that's a good prayer for us, that God would keep us occupied with gladness of heart. And so that we live with uh, contentment uh, throughout life. And so, man, what a great day of reading scripture. Uh, such important scripture. I would encourage you to go back through and underline some of those verses in Ecclesiastes. Maybe even post in the comments of, of, uh, of the various things that stuck out you know, to you. There's a lot here. So, you know, many of us could comment um, on some of the reflections on money. Some of the reflections on, you know, contentment. And then obviously, if you want to com comment something on on, uh, on Luke and the goodness of our God, uh, man, what an incredible um, end of the the, chap the book of Luke. So grateful for a God who has risen from the, from the dead and who has come to save us. And uh, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm grateful that uh, we could have the time to, uh, to read together um, every day. I appreciate you uh, um, subscribing to the YouTube channel and also uh, making sure that you share it. Um, congratulations on finishing the book of Luke. Okay, I finished up another book of the Bible, and uh, that is tremendous success. Whatever other successes you have today, that's a, that's one of the one of the best. Honestly, it's one of the greatest. You finished up another book of the Bible, and uh, I want to really congratulate you on that. All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you, God. We have so many blessings in our lives. Thank you, God, that we can uh, read your word. Thank you, Lord, that we finished up another book and we're absorbing, Lord, your truth. We're absorbing the truth of who you are. God, you tell us that we'll, if we'll have the faith the size of a mustard seed, that we'll be able to command mountains to be moved and they'll be moved. And Lord, as we read, we, we feel our, our faith growing. And uh, Lord, we want it to be, <clears throat> we want our faith even to be more than just a mustard seed, but that we would that we would exercise faith and uh, Lord, we will, um, you know, we will just have a, a, a solid faith where we put our trust in you in all things. God, you know, the, um, you know, the heaviness of our hearts in the various areas of life. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have faith um, in you in those areas as well. Lord, you, you tell us that you keep your eyes on the sparrow. And uh, Lord, you know us even more than uh, 
more than the sparrows. Lord, you know the number of hairs on our head. God, you know us intimately inside and out. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to um, just know that you care about the things that uh, that weigh us down. And so, Lord, we just, we love you. We thank you, God, for this day. We pray your blessing on each one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. I look forward to, uh, to jumping into the book of Amos with you tomorrow um, as, uh, as we continue on reading the word of God. All right. Have a wonderful day.